Okay, Barry, it's good to have you here. Thanks, Gary. And I just want to tell you about your great book. Every year or two, I take it off the shelf and I read it again. And do you know it's held up beautifully through the years? The amount of research you did to make a background for the search for life on Mars is excellent. And indeed, uh, everything about it, from the snow algae on, uh, lays a wonderful setting for the experiment to look for life on Mars. Everything in the book backs up my ultimate claim that, yeah, we did find life on Mars. And I admit, it took me, what was it, 20 years before I finally said, hey, the facts are so compelling that I've got to say it. And even though I knew it was going to make the world mad as hell at me, especially when Chuck Klein and Jerry Soffin kept telling me not to say anything, uh, I felt I had to say it, because otherwise I you know, couldn't classify myself as a scientist. I believe when a scientist reaches a conclusion, he's obligated by ethics to state it, whether people like it or not. And similarly, I think now, scientific ethics require that astrobiologists look afresh at these data and reach a conclusion. It's not enough to say, well, it might be so, let's wait for the next mission. The next mission isn't going to come for 10 or 20 years, and the next mission is being planned based on there is no life on Mars, as are manned missions to Mars. So if indeed we know now there is life on Mars, it will change the whole program of NASA, and also it will change many other things uh, about life on Earth. So I think it's an obligation on the part of the scientific community to look at these data afresh and see whether a conclusion can be drawn. If so, we're way ahead of the game. If not, let's say, hey, there is no proof. Let's continue finding out whether there's life on Mars or elsewhere. Anyway, as I review the book, uh, it takes me back, of course, and here I just flip it open to a page of Vish, Wolf Vishniak and Pat Strat. Uh, he's in his Arctic outfit just before he went down to the Antarctic, lost his life. You know, this was a long path going to Mars. It began in 1958 when I first wrote a proposal for NASA and ended when our final contract ended in 1980. We did have three years of work after the mission ended. We proposed to NASA to do laboratory work, to try and discriminate between a biological response to our system or a chemical response or a physical one. And NASA said they would only fund the study if we limited it to looking for chemical and physical explanations, no biological ones. Now, there again, that's not quite scientific, is it? You're supposed to explore both sides of an issue, but they didn't want that. But we took the contract and worked for three years very diligently trying to find a way to explain the results we got without using microorganisms. And we were not able to do it. And since then, in all these years, 34 years since we got our results, no one has been able to produce in the laboratory or even in theory any material or physical activity that would duplicate not just the initial positive response, because that's kind of easy to duplicate, but the controls, the thermal controls, they just defy chemical answers. So those are the things I would like to see considered. They have not been adequately considered. Most of the time when scientists say the LR did not find life on Mars, and you say, why do you say that? And so, it's the consensus of the scientists. Well, consensus is not the way that science goes. Uh, 
By its very definition, science is not a democratic process. It's never a majority that discovers something new. It's always one person. And the majority is almost always against that finding, because, especially if it's a major finding, because they've been taught what the truth is uh, when they went through school. And it did not include, of course, the new finding, which startles the understanding that they had prior to the new finding. So it takes a long time before, as they say, the paradigm is broken. And this book was the first step towards breaking that paradigm about there being no life outside of the earth. So I believe that as time goes on, your book's going to be recognized as a signal effort in founding, really, the now science of astrobiology. And, uh, I'm very thankful to you for having seen very early in the game that there was some merit in the label of these experiment, and to have devoted so much of your book to covering that experiment, and then giving me an opportunity at the end to contribute a chapter explaining uh, my position. And of course, the book was released simultaneously with the paper I gave and had printed in the SPY annual meeting and proceedings of 1997. So the paper and the book debuted simultaneously and made an impact on the astrobiological world, although at that time it certainly was could not be construed as a favorable impact, and we took a lot of abuse for it, and we still take abuse. But I have been keeping tabs, and in recent years, believe it or not, I've got 20 plus, I think it's about 22 scientists, prominent scientists, who now say, yes, they believe that I did find life on Mars. And interestingly enough, just last week, in a meeting in which I participated with Chris McKay, he said, Gil, you know, I think the biological explanation is becoming more probable. So what more can you ask? Well, what more I do ask is that we get the Chris McKay's of this world together and consider the evidence, which has not been done since 1977, that's the last time when the National Science Foundation convened a meeting to review the evidence and concluded that we did not detect life on Mars. We've learned an awful lot since then. Isn't it time to get a group together again? Not those old prejudiced old timers, but the new crop of astrobiologists who have open minds and who will listen and evaluate and decide. Am I correct in concluding that the label release experiment detected life on Mars, or am I overreaching? Thanks, Larry. Thank you.